Well, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Wildy Garden. And in this video, we are going to be looking at how to make a bog garden. Now, if you're asking what is a bog garden, now this is an area that stays damp most of the year and it allows us to grow a different variety of plants, if you like, to our normal herbaceous borders. So where I am at the moment, making this wildlife pond, don't worry, it's meant to look that orange. We've just literally finishing off the edges. We've got a bit more subsoil to put along this edge uh, before we think about planting this pond. However, um, on the, well, I'll come back to where we're going to site it in a minute. You can see herbaceous borders, we're all familiar with them. They are uh, a border of herbaceous perennials, sometimes annuals, sometimes biennials, sometimes uh, perennials, which obviously come back year after year, annuals, of course. They have their whole life cycle within one year, such as a poppy, biennials, grow in the first year, flower in the second, then die. Um, slightly sidetracked, but herbaceous borders, we are used to them, they're all, in across, they're all across our gardens across the UK. However, a bog garden is somewhere where we can have a different type of planting, if you like, and introduce lots more native wildflowers that thrive off wet spaces, or in wet spaces, should I say. And here we are going to be looking at how to make your very own. Now, it's very simple. Um, now here we have a wildlife pond, which obviously, as I say, we're just finishing off now. We are about to get cracking on the planting, just a little bit more subsoil around the edges. You can just see the top of the line there. However, in this area, which you can see working nicely, we're going to make a bog garden. Now, this bit's a little further on, uh, of course, than starting from scratch. So in essence, I'll put a clip in now of some of the uh, photos and things that I've got back when we started this pond. Uh, because this was an old concrete lined pond originally and it was an area that was um, obviously thriving for a long time. There was 30 or 40 smooth newts we took out of this pond with safely rehoused that are going to uh, make their way back into this water body now that it's establishing. However, underneath, um, sorry for my uh, uh, the sound of my voice by the way, I've got a bit of a cold at the moment, it's not COVID, don't worry. <laughs> However, um, sound a bit gruff, so apologies for that if you're used to uh, my normal voice, it might sound a bit different on this video. Anyway, uh, this bog garden uh, is a different uh, style of garden, like I say, but it, it has a concrete liner, well, say liner, a concrete lining underneath it, if you like. This was uh, an original water body that was made through just a, basically a skim of concrete, three or four inches thick on top of the soil. Now, that's fine, it worked for years. As I say, lots of newts in this water body. However, it got a bit of a crack in it, as these things do over time. It's probably 20, 30 years old, and of course started to leak. So, we've reinstated it, we've took a lot of the concrete out, made it deeper, because this area of the pond was only about 20 to 30 uh, centimeters deep around uh, some of it, and in the middle even only, you know, maybe 30 to 40 centimeters deep. How deep should your wildlife pond be? Check out one of my previous videos if you haven't already. Um, and I'll put a link in to uh, that video as to how deep your wildlife pond should be at the end of this video. Uh, anyway, we wanted to make this one deeper. So we took out a lot of the concrete, dug it down, fleece line of fleece, same as all my other ponds, as you will have seen already, no doubt, and uh, put some subsoil back in, which we've imported this stuff because this stuff here was horrible clay, which we couldn't have done anything with, certainly not planted in it anyway. Um, so we have relined this pond and we've basically got the old concrete lip under here which we have left in that we've kind of uh, lipped over the liner so the liner has gone from uh, this pond into this bog garden then it sort of dips down into the bottom of this um, old concrete part of the pond which we've left in because it was plenty deep enough probably about 40 centimeters deep 16 inches roughly in old money so we put a liner on top of that so it holds a bit of water now you're probably thinking why is this soil different color compared to that soil well let's take a look so i've come down to ground level just to show you the difference between the two soils now the two soils are very very important uh, when you're talking about a wildlife pond when you're having a wildlife pond in your garden when you're building a wildlife pond uh, you want it to be poor, sort of infertile soils to really make sure there's a, a lack of nutrients in the water. If there's lots of nutrients, lots of sort of nitrates, it means that you can get a buildup of algae, uh, buildup of algal blooms, duckweed and all sorts of problems. So you want to keep the, um, the sort of pH of the water as, as sort of neutral as possible if you can. But in the bog garden, it's not a problem because we're not going to have lots and lots of standing water where we're going to 
rely on clear water for obviously invertebrates to thrive and live out their life cycles. So it doesn't matter in here, it can be um, almost anything. It can be more subsoil, not a problem at all, but this was existing soil that was in uh, this part of the bog garden as it was. And you can see it's this lovely uh, sort of rich black topsoil, which um, is fine. It's gonna be just what you're used to in your normal borders, uh, unless you've got clay, sorry about that if you have. Uh, so a fine topsoil is not a problem at all in uh, a bog garden so you can see that's not a problem and we have the subsoil there where the kind of the liner it just as i say sort of flaps over from the wildlife pond into the bog garden this is a separate liner in the bog garden which just creates a bit of a dish um, and then we've got you know minimum six inches of topsoil back on top of the fleece so we have still protected the liner in the bog garden so once you've dug your bog garden, and it can be any size, I mean, you can do something the size of um, an old sink if you wanted to, or even sink an old sink in the ground, fill it full of soil. Of course, that will hold a certain amount of water uh, and create a different type of area within your garden, allow you to grow different plants. Um, so it can be any size, any depth, really. Obviously, the deeper it is, the more water it's going to retain in that kind of dish, depending on how high up you put your liner. To line the area, you want a bit of fleece or underlay to protect the line, although it's not imperative. I mean, sometimes, depending on how wet you want the bog garden to be, you can even puncture the liner in the bottom to allow a bit of the water to drain out. If it, if it does get too waterlogged, um, you can do that, of course. So, uh, and the liner could be almost anything. You could use uh, a PVC liner or a rubber butyl liner, which, which this is, so should last a long time. Uh, but again, if you're covering it up like this, it's not gonna degrade through the UV rays. So dig your hole, whatever size you can physically um, manage and uh, afford to give up as part of your garden. Um, go down to, you know, anywhere from six inches down to 30 centimeters, absolutely fine at all. Uh, fine, uh, it just depends on how deep you want your uh, bog garden to sit, how much water you want it to hold. So I'll leave that to you guys. So dig your dish, nice shallow margins around the edges, of course, so that if anything does drop in, hedgehogs, you know, frogs, newts, that sort of thing, they can climb out. You don't want it steep-sided, of course, although if you're gonna be filling it right up to near the top with the soil, things won't really be able to drop in much at all. So dig your hole, get it fleece line fleeced, uh, and then the top soil back on top. And uh, we're gonna look now at some of the plants in which you can put in your new bog garden. Okay, so as you can see, we now have the bog garden ready for planting. The main pond is now planted. That's gonna start clearing very soon there's already newts that have gone back into that pond so now we need to add a couple of vital ingredients into your bog garden that is this good old rotting wood which is fantastic as a habitat now it's often known in the wider countryside as riparian habitat which is where you know you get a lot of wet woodland which is a very very good habitat for a lot of birds a lot of insects in particular but having this rotting wood is going to be a great habitat for things such as stag beetles lesser stag beetles because they love living inside that rotting wood and it just provides a wonderful habitat. So in this bog garden, as in every bog garden, you should look to get a few pieces of dead wood in your garden, in your bog garden, and just kind of nestle them in. Great for um, dragonflies as well. Things like southern hawker dragonflies will come and lay their eggs into the rotting timber around a bog garden, around a pond as well. So um, get some rotting logs in your bog garden and it'll really help just create some nice nooks and crannies for newts, frogs, toads, dragonfly larvae and the like. So that's the logs in the garden now and now we're going to take a look at some of the plants you can plant. Okay so now I have 21 species of plant I'm going to talk to you about briefly. This isn't a definitive list obviously this is just a few of some of the plants that I plant in and around the ponds and bog gardens that I make around the UK. Um, so pick and choose from these as you like. I'll try and explain a little bit about them. Stay with me because there will be some useful hints and tips. Uh, I'm sure if you haven't got some of these in your garden, then you can get some of them and put them elsewhere in your garden. Even if you've already got an existing pond and you're looking to do a bog garden, these plants will grow well in damp conditions. They don't have to be on the edge of a water body. So in our bog garden, you can see we actually have some standing water. I've made bog gardens before where they are just wet soil. They don't have to have sand in water, um, but uh, as long as the soil is wet most of the year, they should be absolutely fine. So without further ado, I shall make a start. Now this one is a water plantain, which um, 
is a really lovely little plant. It loves to go right on the edge of the water. So I'm gonna put this one right where the water starts in this bug garden. Lovely little white flower. And um, yeah, great for insects. Hoverflies love it in particular. These lovely, when it gets bigger, these lovely kind of vertical, um, almost um, arrow-like. It's not the same as arrowhead, the leaf, but it's very similar. Lovely big pointy leaves. So water plantain, a good one. Next we have Devil's Bit Scabious, which is uh, a cracking plant and actually will grow in damp conditions or in drier soil types, you know, limestone, chalk, uh, grass, and will grow very well. Exclu excuse the plane noise, we're uh, right next to Heathrow Airport, so uh, I'll let the plane pass. Devil's Bit Scabious, great late summer flowering plant. And this one. It's hemp agrimony, which does get very big. Bear it in mind, it gets to maybe three, four foot, sometimes five foot and even six foot in shady areas in the garden. Love full sun, great for a midsummer plant for uh, peacock butterflies, love it in particular, a lot of hoverflies. Hemp agrimony, you don't need many of these, they make a big clump in themselves. This one is square stemmed St. John's wort, bit of a mouthful. It's just about to come into flower. There's some around the pond that we've just planted that is flowering now. Uh, this lovely, as the name suggests, square stem. Uh, great for smaller insects. This one loves a boggy ground. Here is a plant that most of you will know, but the more common varieties. This is water mint, uh, loved by the holly blue butterflies when it's in flower. And it has this lovely little pink sort of white pom-poms almost, um, absolutely. Just smells divine if you brush past it, but be warned, as with any other mint, it does spread by runners, which you can see it doing here. It's sending out little uh, roots and shoots, so it will spread and make a big clump. So you don't need, again, many water, uh, water mints. This has finished flowering now, but this is um, marsh marigold, momentary lapse. Uh, this is marsh marigold, a very good plant for April, known also as king cups. And if you haven't checked it out already, do check out my video. Check out my video on marsh marigold I've done specifically around my pond back in April time. One of the first splashes of colour to uh, grow around the margins of a pond in spring. Marsh marigold, absolutely brilliant. Great for peacock butterflies again when they're first emerging from winter. Uh, water avens, doesn't look like much now. and. Um, these will flower next year now, but they uh, are part of the GM family. So if you've got GMs in your garden, have these lovely kind of pendunculate sort of maroon and apricot colored bells. Really lovely flower they are. Great, right on the water's edge again. Flag iris, friend or foe. Um, this is yellow flag iris, it's a native flag iris. Uh, and actually they are very good um, as a pollinator, but of course they do create very big clumps. Quite often they can make really really, really big clumps. So um, lovely yellow flower in it, but be warned again, yellow flag iris. So I'm gonna put one in this garden, in this bog garden right at the far end so it can be easily chopped back if you need to be. You can be pretty ruthless with this stuff. Water figwort. Now I've got some in the garden at the moment. It's got a very small little discreet red flower, almost solely pollinated by wasps, um, but great for the mullein moth uh, as a larval food plant. So you can quite often find these big light blue, black and yellow uh, moth caterpillars at this time of year, sort of early July on these plants right now. Bog bean, very aptly named. This is a bare root specimen, so you can see the roots coming out there where it will root into the soil. Best put sort of horizontally down into the soil, and then this will shoot up with these lovely leaves. It's actually a larval food plant of the elephant hawk moth as well. So quite often you can find these rather odd looking caterpillars, massive caterpillars sat on the end of this. Really good, lovely little flower on the end of that. Um, it has finished flowering now. Um, then we move on to bird's foot trefoil on steroids. This is greater bird's foot trefoil. And as you can see, it has a profusion of the yellow flowers. Be warned, it does make a big clump again. But uh, um, contrary to the bird's foot trefoil, this stuff loves having its feet wet. So it will grow very well around the edges of a pond or indeed a bog garden. Then we have this sneeze work, which doesn't look like much at the moment. Um, it should be flowering now. These are just obviously small specimens, um, but they will probably still flower this year. Almost like a mini version of yarrow. Again, loves the damp conditions. Gypsy wort, uh, another one which is a little bit like a nettle, has a discreet little white flower against the main stem. Um, will form a nice clump, gets to a good height of a couple of feet. 
uh, and just does a really good job of providing a lot of nectar for a lot of uh, insects. And this lovely dainty specimen is um, Lesser Spearwort, which is actually part of the ranunculus family. It's almost like a buttercup. Uh, so uh, it has these lovely little dainty yellow flowers. They do get a bit leggy as you can see when they're in pots, but uh, this one will get a cut back after it's flowered and be a lovely splash of yellow again. Next spring and early summer, I move forward a little bit. Then we have these skull cap, which are, uh, they're not flowering yet, they're lovely kind of bluey purple flower, a little bit sort of snapdragon-y if you like, toe flaxy. Uh, just love a damp condition. Don't get very big, great for, you know, the, the edge of a pond where you don't want the vegetation to get too tall. Tansy, obviously a herb, many of you are probably familiar with. Has a lovely smell to it and little sort of yellow button-like flowers at the top of the spikes. They can get, um, you know, sort of three to four feet, no problem at all. And good in semi-shade conditions, Tansy. Loved by the holly blue and uh, yeah, a really good plant for uh, a damp area. Common flea bane, fantastic. Looks like a weed, although what is a weed? Hey, just a plant in the wrong place. Lovely yellow button-like flowers again on the top, which uh, are very attractive for the gatekeeper butterfly, which will be coming out in the next week or two. I'll let the plane go over. Yeah, so common flea bane, uh, it does create a nice clump, gets to sort of 18 inches, two foot high, no problem at all. Again, another plant like the Devil's Bit Scabious that will go well in dry or wetter conditions. So a really good one uh, and just has these yeah, lovely little yellow heads on it. When it comes into flower, which I've just seen one or two in the wild starting to flower recently. This one you might recognize is a, uh, a marshmallow. Um, nope, you can't eat it, uh, but it's uh, part of the mallow family. Common mallow this time of year are swathes of pink up and down the motorways. They'll grow almost anywhere, the common mallow, but the marshmallow loves to have its feet wet. So uh, another good one for a pond edge will make a nice clump. Now, if you've got a wet enough area, uh, this doesn't look like much now, but this is flowering rush. And this creates a really, really beautiful sort of allium-like flower almost. These lovely sort of maroons and whites in the flower head. So a really good one for the edge of a water body a bit like this or, or very wet soil. And then what bog garden would be complete without some purple loose strife? This stuff is just coming into flower now in the wild and in my own garden. These obviously being potted specimens aren't quite there yet. However, they are a fantastic plant for pollinators and have such a long flowering period right from July all the way through to August and sometimes into September as well, where they can provide a lot of nectar for a lot of insects, especially the later summer ones. Um, also, last two, bear with me, cuckoo flower, one of my absolute favorites, springtime uh, specialty plant, this one, larval food plant of the orange tip butterfly and the green vein white, um, lovely little uh, sort of discreet white flower, um, lady smock it's also known as, but loves wet ground, so cuckoo flower, really good one, low growing again, so great for the edge of a pond that you don't want to get too high. And last but not least, doesn't look like much again now, but Ragged Robin, uh, these gorgeous little sort of pink, almost look like they've been cut with a pair of scissors, the flowers. Um, really good as a nectar source in the spring for lots and lots of butterflies and bees and moths as well. Um, but again, another nice low growing clump forming perennial, which will do really well in boggy ground. So hopefully that's given you plenty of options as to what to put in your bog garden. What I'm gonna do now is space these out um, Put a bit of a clip in of, a, of me planting them and then uh, we'll see how it looks when we're finished. Well that's all the plants spaced out as you can see I've put some in the actual water body itself it's only maybe an inch or two in the middle so a lot of the plants in the middle things like the purple loose strife and the water plantain will do especially well having very wet feet and being even partially submerged so not a problem there so all that's left to do now is get them in.
So there you have it. One times bog garden complete and raring to go and of course some of these plants will still flower this year even though it's early July things like the purple loose strife, hemp agrimony, common flea bane will still put up a flower spike or two I'm sure once they've got their roots or their feet down into this damp soil and uh, have established themselves a little bit and provide nectar and pollen of course for our pollinated insects so can't wait to come back and see how this thing is doing in a month or so's time along with the wildlife pond which of course has been completely planted now um just got a little bit of wildflower seed to uh, drop around the edges of that along with the bug garden that's one thing you can do incidentally if you want to completely fill in the gaps and add a few wet loving grasses and a few more wildflower species in between the plants that you've planted and of course you can do these as plugs or nine centimeter potted plants um doesn't really matter nine centimeter potted plants obviously cost a bit more but you've got a much more established plant much better chance of um it establishing and producing flowers a lot sooner um so depending on when you plant these and of course time of year you can really do these anytime from sort of march through till october really um just avoid the colder months if you can but um, something that could be done very easily and on a budget and so, so uh, therefore provide another vital habitat for wildlife in your own garden, uh, which is the key thing. It's creating this network of habitats around the country so that wildlife can kind of hopscotch its way across the country a lot more easily um, and we can provide a corridor for our wildlife to move across the country. So thank you very much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed the video and been, in, and been inspired to create one of these. As I say, it doesn't matter how big it is, it is, even a small one can be beneficial for wildlife. So thanks very much for watching guys. Feel free to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and give the video a like and I'll be sure to bring you many more videos on all the ways in which you can help wildlife in videos to come. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.